is Broadcast Beat Magazine with Ryan Salazar. Ryan Salazar here with Broadcast Beat Magazine. We like to cover interesting people, and we found a guy in Toronto, John Sandeman. He's a broadcast professional. How you doing, sir? Good, Ryan. How are you on this brisk morning in Toronto as we get into our autumn weather? <laughs> doing good here in Fort Lauderdale. So tell us about your career. We want to we want to cover interesting folks that have been in broadcast, cam- camera operators, editors, that sort of thing, and learn about their careers. And you've got a, quite an interesting career. So if you don't mind, uh, go ahead and tell us about how you got started. Wow, it is uh, it is quite diverse. Um, I started off in uh, broadcast at a, a network called Global Television Network in Toronto. And they had uh, big remote mobile production trucks that would go and do remotes. And I started off as a TV assistant after I got out of uh, college for radio and television. And then I worked for them for about six months. And then I went into a a news company in Toronto called uh, City TV, City Pulse News. And I became a cameraman and I was there for like six years. So I covered news, sports and uh, weather. And also... um, I ended up being a field producer, working on uh, multiple different series that, that would air on, on, the, uh, on the channel. And in addition, uh, the TV station had a, uh, a music station called Much Music. So uh, we would help Much Music by going doing interviews or going on tour with The Who or Michael Jackson or whatever the case is. So um, as a cameraman, I got to experience quite a bit. However, uh, that does wear and tear on you after a while. And... Uh, after six years or so of covering the crime beat, the Toronto police approached me and said, hey, you know, we're looking at getting into doing training videos and corporate communication videos, and we're looking for a professional who could do that. So, of course, I said, uh, yeah, I could be interested. Uh, the pay was a little less back then, but there was a pension, and uh, that kind of intrigued me, and uh, so I, I did it. And the cool thing about them is they allowed me to do freelance while I was with the police department. So as long as it wasn't legal stuff, uh, they were okay about it as long as there's no conflict of interest. And what that meant to me is I have a passion for sports. Uh, so I got to go to international events and work in international events as a cameraman or as a technician or whatever the case may be and uh, take my holidays and, and do that. So even within the police department, when I first started, I was a one-man operation, um, and it grew eventually to become a 25-person operation in charge of all video, whether it be video evidence or corporate communications videos or training videos or Facebook videos or whatever video it is, was coming out of this one central repository. Um, so that was quite interesting because we also had two enhancement um, units that would enhance videos of, of crimes, uh, try to identify people or persons or places or things. Um, and we pushed out 70,000 evidence videos a year. Um, so that also got me into learning about digital video asset management because we realized that we cannot continue at this rate because where are we going to store these videos? We're going to have to have a brick and mortar place to store these videos. And that's going to be very costly because with law enforcement, some videos have to be kept for eternity, um, especially if a person committed murder and it's a witness statement of a murder. Uh, they got to keep that video for eternity. So when that person goes for parole, they can pull this video out and see what the person looked like before, what he was acting before, and then now, you know, compare it. Um, and they're very particular in law enforcement and in the judiciary about continuity. Uh, who touched the video, where the video was held, uh, uh, who watched the video. So I started getting into developing a digital video asset management system where police officers would come to the station and when they booked the person, they would touch screen and enter the badge number and the badge number, the computer would then validate that badge number with the, uh, or shield numbers it's called in the States, they would um, validate that number with the nominal role to say, okay, you know, shield number one, two, three, four, uh, Officer Smith, yes, that's correct, and it would continue to, to keep on doing that. Every type of information that was punched into the computer would be validated, and they couldn't do the next step until that information was validated. And the purpose of that, from what I learned on my own, was that metadata and digital video asset management is so important, especially when you want to try to find stuff. And when you're dealing with human nature as it is, you can't expect people to go in after an event and type in this information because they won't. It's just human nature. People forget. They get tied up doing other things. So then what you have is what I call a stranded asset. You have an asset out there that's got no metadata to it that you'll never find. And, of course, the challenge with that is if you don't find this video for court, chances are that case will be thrown out of court because the lawyer, defense lawyers say, I was not given a chance to see the video, so I don't have all the evidence. So in Canada, they have no choice but to throw the video out. Uh, And hence, probably throw the case out as well. So these videos were very, very... um, very uh, 
what do I say, uh, high priority, uh, high risk videos that we had to maintain. And can you imagine when we first started this whole process, a homicide investigator coming to us with a video saying, this video uh, has to be ingested and I don't want you to lose it. <laughs> so uh, now you're at the, you know, the, the technology, you're at the, uh, you know, forgiveness of the technology, whether the technology is going to work or not. But eventually they gained the trust. Uh, the system had integrity. And now uh, it's been, the system has been taken over and has been used by other large police services, such as Chicago. Uh, I know a big company has bought the system called uh, Taser, and now they're rolling it out to uh, assist with the body-worn cameras. Um, and when you take a look at that evidence side, it makes sense to have one video house uh, under your roof. So one, one operation where the people that work there understand video. And they've been trained on video, and they know the compression. They know everything about video. It's um, it's really interesting. And uh, video in law enforcement right now is exploding. Uh, people don't realize that when you take a look at there's in-car camera videos, there's body-worn camera videos, there's CCTV videos that are out there by personal, private companies. It's, I mean, it's hard not to go in any city these days and not be on video, whether it be in a bank machine, a condominium, or a taxi, or a bus. So when you take a look at a crime, they have to gather all these videos together and they have to manage these videos. Um, it's, it's a very big undertaking. And I'm, I'm sitting back watching this body worn camera stuff and, and seeing how they're going to manage the storage and, and where they're going to, uh, where they're going to run into issues with disclosure when they've got to prepare all this video and get it to court on time. Uh, so in Canada, that's a big issue. So uh, I think that you'll see a lot of law enforcement agencies such as Toronto, LA, New York, you know, the big five, the big four, taking their time doing body-worn cameras because it's not just about putting a camera on a police officer. It's about how are we going to manage this? How are we going to transfer this information to a central repository? And, and what type of storage are we going to need? Uh, so, I mean, out front, the camera is probably 1500 bucks or whatever, but the back end is, is where the money is going to be. So I digress. Anyhow, that's not bad from starting off as a cameraman at a news station. So I, I've retired from Toronto Police. And now I do consulting, and I also uh, work for Global TV. One of the first people that hired me uh, called me up and said, would you do freelance as a mobile engineer and, and eventually as a, as a news camera? So I'm doing both for them. I'm, uh, they call me the Swiss Army Knife at Global TV because uh, whatever they're short, I can go in and do it. And I think that's the key to success these days because we're in such a... Uh, you know, an industry that's forever changing and, and broadcast television, uh, it's just so hard to keep up. I mean, you read magazine after magazine, you try to go to trade shows to keep up, but uh, going from three quarter inch tape when I first started, I could go back even further at college. We had quarter inch black and white reel to reel tape. Uh, now down to an SD card with all your information on this little SD card is phenomenal. Um, I mean, I, I freelance, uh, I enjoy freelance, I'm my own boss. I just finished uh, doing some stuff for PGA Canada, the Professional Golf Association of Canada. They had a tour up here. I think they have 12, 12 tournaments a year. And it's phenomenal that we shoot the tournament. We do a loose edit, and we FTP it to uh, St. Augustine in Florida. And they tighten up the edit. They put the graphics. They put all the PGA stuff on, and it's on, it's on the web like in two hours. And I sit back and go, this is mind-boggling because when you talk about the days when I first started, we were shipping tapes by FedEx. Or, or by airplane. So uh, the technology is forever changing. And uh, I think, uh, you know, I'm, I'm glad to be part of it. And I'm very excited. But my passion will always be as a news camera, as getting the story, seeing it go on the big screen, and, and seeing that your best shots are being used. That's always going to be my passion. And I think once that's, once that's ingrained in you, that uh, it's, it's hard to take away from you. And, and John, and, and I think John, it's really cool, uh, you know, the history behind your career. I also noticed that um, you did some Olympic stuff. Is that right? Yeah, I was a contractor. I was a freelance. I didn't, I wasn't an employee of them, but uh, they hire a bunch of freelancers. Um, I think if you go on their website, uh, you'll see all the freelance uh, opportunities there are. So uh, I've worked in London. I've worked in Vancouver. I also worked for a company called International Sports Broadcasting Television, who did the first summer Olympics in Azerbaijan. Uh, that was very interesting uh, because I didn't know where Azerbaijan was. And when I looked at the map, I said, my God, what am I getting into here? <laughs> but uh, I worked with 16 phenomenal Karen from around the world, from Ireland, England, Scotland, uh, USA, um, Canada. And uh, they, these guys, uh, Spain, 
Um, these guys were number one. Their their video, their quality of video was just so clean, so crisp, so solid. I, I was amazed at the stuff I would come back at. So I was their manager, a deputy manager. Um, myself and the, the manager, uh, Guillermo, uh, we were quite the team, but uh, we were shooters. So we understood their challenges. We understood what it took to, you know, make a good picture. And we were able to always give advice and coach them. But they didn't need much coaching when it came to technology. Uh, what they need help with is uh, getting through the uh, security issues, uh, dealing with people. And, and they were good at that, too, because they had character and they weren't afraid to work. And, you know, we would do 14, 16 hour days and not one of them would ever complain. But as a manager, as a deputy manager, you make sure that when you can, you can cut them to like, you know, five hours or cut them for a day off to make up for it. So uh, I think if I can say to anybody uh, who's starting in the business is don't be afraid to work hard. And don't be one of those that are complaining about the hours. Just do your job and and, and do it with skill and talent and have character and uh, fortitude. And uh, and that's what it's all about. That's how you survive in this industry. I mean, you could sit back and say, you want this, you want that. But nowadays, there's not too many people that are willing to give, especially in the broadcast industry. Uh, you've got to be able to offer your talents in a multiple discipline way. So. Well, that's excellent. And so I'm sure you've had your hands on uh, quite a few cool cameras in your time. Yeah, uh, 4K stuff in uh, Azerbaijan, the Panasonic stuff, uh, the red stuff. But, uh, you know, 4K, I find that fascinating, too, because we couldn't even edit over there because the edit facilities just didn't have the storage for it. So they actually took the raw footage back to Spain to edit there. Uh, I do corporate videos, and I have clients say to me, can I get this in 4K? And I said, okay, so what's, where's your end result? Where, where, where do you want this video to appear? Oh, we want it to appear on the web. And you go, okay, well, really? Uh, if you're not going <laughs> to see 4K on the web, but we want it because that's the latest technology. We've heard it's the latest technology. So, sure, no problem. If they're willing to pay for it, yeah, we'll do it. But uh, you end up having to you know, dump it down to 2K or you know, HD. Right. Well, you know, and, and if I think back, you know, and, and I'm even talking technology from way back because I, I, I'm a lover of older technology as well, too. Like even thinking back to how how the weight of cameras has changed and, the, and oh. the, obviously the technology. But I remember I had a cable TV show when I was 17 years old and that was cr quite crazy. Uh, but uh, I, I was we were working on uh, Super VHS, which we thought was the new uh, the new thing yeah. right yeah. after Betacam SP. Uh, but yeah. man, Betacam, the beta cameras. Uh, the, oh my god <laughs> they were huge well you know i uh, go back to then when i when i started uh, we did have color tv contrary to what you might think but uh we had uh we had the shoulder mount camera and it was a shotgun zoom meaning you had you know push it in and out with your hand and we had a pack we had to carry a recorder a bvu 50 sony recorder um uh, and we had to light everything with uh redheads because <laughs> these these things weren't that great when it came to nighttime I mean, I can tell you a story that uh, I worked with a reporter who's dead now, Mark Daly, a great, great guy, and we're still best. We were still best of friends up to his death. He uh, he was a crime reporter here, and you know, one time we had to do a quick shot in front of the courthouse, and I said, Mark, why why are we driving the courthouse? Because no one's going to see in the background. Let's just stand in the parking lot and say you're from the courthouse, and no one will ever know. And uh, that's what we did. No one ever knew because it's so black behind them that uh, it's uh, you would need like you know massive lights to get any type of light. So yeah, where the technology evolved to the cameras today and you know, the cameras, the XD cams are, are, are still 15 pounds or so, uh, but comparatively speaking, you don't have to carry half the gear. You know, you know, the batteries last for like three hours in the past, as you know, with your cable show, you'd have to bring about 15 batteries in the last 20 minutes. Um, so just seeing that technology evolve for the better. And the quality is phenomenal. I mean, uh, you know, people say the cell phone, iPhone video photo, and that is good quality. My, my gosh, I use it all the time as well. But you can't beat a broadcast camera. Uh, and, and hopefully they, they keep continuing to evolve and get even better, better pictures. So. It's amazing. You know, the cameras used to be 30, 40, 50 pounds, depending on what you had on them. Like you had the remote, uh, yeah. the tape recorder or whatever on the yeah. side. Um, yeah. But now you get cameras that are 5, 10 pounds. It's crazy. Well, now, but the problem is, is, as the technology evolves, the transmission technology, uh, it's getting heavier, too, because, you know, now you've got a battery pack on the back, you've got your wireless mic on the back, and now you've got some sort of transmission on the back. So uh, it's, it's evolving that way. They're still continuing to put stuff on the back of the camera. But uh, you know what? It's all good. It's all getting better. The quality is there. And uh, the Sony product, uh, the XD cam, is great. Uh, I personally, I have... I use the XD cam and broadcast. I use a P2 camera. For, for my own self, I have 
a Canon XF 300 camera and I have a DLSR. I, I'm just still not a big fan of the DLSR. It's beautiful pictures, but I'm a cameraman and I enjoy having a video camera on my shoulder. And uh, it's interesting. Uh, the XF 300 from Canon is 50 megabits 422, and that's broadcast quality. Uh, and, and it's a really good little camera. So I use a variety of cameras, you're right. I've used red cameras as well. And it all depends where your end result, you know, where, where your end result is like, where, where are the viewers going to watch this? Uh, so it's all good. All right, John. Well, thank you so much again, John Sandeman, broadcast professional from Toronto. Really appreciate chatting with you today. Ryan, thanks for the opportunity. It was great chatting with broadcast beat magazine and, uh, hope to see you in the future somewhere at some convention.